worried about T.J. Watt. Was that you? Were you the one worried about T.J. Watt? Well, if you were, Cam Hayward had two choice words for you after yesterday's game here. He's fine. Good morning, good Monday morning. I'm Dan Kovacevic of DK Pittsburgh Sports, and this is Daily Shot of Steelers. Comes your way bright and early every weekday if you're into hockey and or baseball. I also offer up Daily Shots of Penguins and Pirates where you found this. Steelers 23, Bills 16. I was here in Orchard Park, New York to cover it, and I am here to tell you that the player who just got paid the highest amount that's currently going to any defensive player in the NFL stepped right out onto that turf and began earning it. T.J. Watt recording two sacks, a forced fumble, and five, five quarterback hits on Josh Allen. I am further here to tell you that even though this game and this turnaround that the Steelers enjoyed following halftime could easily be highlighted by a bunch of pivotal plays. Deontay Johnson's incredible touchdown catch. The blocked punt by Miles Killebrew that was scooped up by Ulysses Gilbert for a special teams touchdown the really smart read by Cam Sutton and Melvin Ingram of the really stupid call by the Bills on fourth and one to pitch the ball backward. Wow. I'm here to tell you that none of those in my eyes, and I'm only speaking for myself, altered the course of that game quite the way that strip sack by TJ did early on. No, the Steelers did not turn it into points. But it was right then and there that the Bills, and in particular, Allen, universally acclaimed, and I think rightly so, as a top five for sure, top three per a lot of people, quarterback, lost their swagger. Lost their mojo, knew they were in for a real fight. This wasn't going to be bombs away for one of the league's very best at throwing the deep ball. This wasn't going to be exercising some embarrassment of riches with all the wide receiver depth that they have. This wasn't going to be that. This was going to be fleeing pursuit. That's what happened on that play, and that's what ended up, for the most part, keeping Allen way more flat-footed than he prefers to be. I'm not just talking about his running, and I'm talking about his scrambling. I'm talking about his throwing off the rollout to Stefan Diggs the way he did a hundred times when the teams met last year. They took it away. TJ and that play took it away. Alex Highsmith and Ingram, who rotated pretty much evenly. Three guys between two slots to make sure that everybody was staying fresh and energetic and dynamic. But it was right then and there, I thought, that TJ sent the message that this game was going to be, well, we're not just going to hand it to you. And Good for him. That's how you play not competing football, not even winning football, contending football. You go into the stadium of a team of that caliber, a division champion that was a participant in the AFC championship game. You go into that stadium not at Heinz Field, no other factors favoring you, whether all the rookies on your side, no excuses, no complaints. And you, as a team leader, 
as an elite player who just signed that contract, you go out there and deliver like that. It changes the whole game. This portion of Daily Shot of Steelers is brought to you by Point Park University. Choose from nearly 100 career-focused programs leading to bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degrees. Choose when, how, and where you'd like to do that learning. Whether it's at Point Park's downtown Pittsburgh campus, whether it's online, maybe it's a flexible hybrid format. Learn more about all of this at pointpark.edu. TJ somewhat predictably wanted really nothing to do with the subject of his weird week leading up to this game. And I know because I asked. After everything this week and, and, and all the positive sentiments that you expressed about the Steelers, does that make this weekend and what just happened today feel that much more special? One and all always feels special. That was it. Really not much more to it. But as I kind of teased you with at the top of this episode, Hayward had a little bit more to say on that subject. He's, a, he's had a heck of a week, but, uh, you know, um, not everybody can do what he does. And, you know, for him to go out there and handle the way he handled and, you know, uh, capitalize on it uh, with a win like this, uh, pretty proud of him. You know, uh, you know, I know it wasn't always pretty for him, and, you know, he wanted to be out there with us, but, you know, uh, got done, um, everybody's happy, and then you get to capitalize with a W on top of it. TJ isn't a one-man show. Football isn't a one-man show. TJ isn't the only reason. He might not even be the primary reason the Steelers are 1-0 and when almost all of the football world expected them to be the reverse. But he is an elite using that term again, catalyst. If you think about the nature of edge rushing, what's the signature stat? It's always sacks. There's now a lot more data and a lot more grading that's available, some of it better than others. But ultimately, it comes down to sacks. And if you're the very best, if you're the cream of the crop in the NFL at getting sacks, you're getting 15, 18, 20 in a 17-game schedule. So the sacks themselves aren't going to be the thing that drives a game. But they're catalysts. They ignite. They spark. I can tell you that in the moment that TJ got that ball, and Hayward pounced on it. And by the way, Cam did a great job of penetrating on that actual play to initially get Allen out of his comfort zone before claiming the actual possession. The sideline went bonkers. It was the first tangible indicator that the Steelers were into it themselves. I'm not suggesting that they were lazy or unfocused or anything like that to start, but they need every team needs in the nfl that little extra something tj gave it to him that's what he does he is the catalyst for this defense and man if you like what you're seeing from this defense you know that that's worth an awful lot when we come back just one question Time for just one question. That's always brought to you on this program by the personal injury law firm of Luxembourg, Garbett, Kelly, and George. They represent people who are hurt in car accidents, who need help with workers' comp, who filed medical malpractice claims. The attorneys at LGKG take pride in keeping their promises. They've been doing that in our region for over 80 years. Learn more about them at lgkg.com or by calling 888 842 Five four five four. J1Q comes from Lori Coleman, who asks, 
why haven't the Steelers signed a tackle with their cap space money? Lori, I'm pretty sure the Steelers themselves, meaning Kevin Colbert, Omar Khan, Mike Tomlin, all the decision makers when it comes to free agency and the cap and that kind of thing, share the sentiment that you're very, very transparently expressing there, which is that the offensive line really wasn't very good. And of all of the offensive linemen who weren't very good, I would place Chooks Okorafor at the top of that list, or depending on your perspective, at the bottom of that list. He was awful. He was awful. He was moved originally going into this summer from right tackle, where he played 15 games last season, to the left side. The thinking being, well, you've got two experienced tackles between Chooks and Zach Banner. Zach Banner hasn't had nearly as much experience, so let's put Banner back on the right side, where he won the job by going against T.J. Watt, incidentally, in the 2020 training camp. Banner doesn't really recover from his knee surgery. He's still got at least two more games to miss on IR. So Chooks has moved back over to his right side after he really struggled on the left. And guess what? He was just as bad on the right side. I can't tell you how many times I isolated on him in live action. Offensive linemen are a tough read unless you are isolated on them. Now, of course, that can be achieved on all 22 film and coaches film and that sort of thing. But having an end zone vantage point, as we do at the Bills home games, I locked in on 76. And I have to tell you, he was playing on roller skates. They were pushing him back. The Bills were very easily. They were going right around him. There were sequences where he just came up with air. He was that lost. He was that confused. I don't know how else to describe it. He's not being physically manhandled. Chooks is a giant of a man with redwood tree trunks for legs. No one's pushing Chooks unless he's doing something wrong. I don't know how else to try to paint this picture for you. I'm not an offensive line coach. I'm not Adrian Clem or Mike Munchak or somebody who could give you some real hot descriptive answer as to what's wrong with him. But something's wrong. And that needs to change. But the one part of this that can't be the change, Lori, is moving Chooks back to left tackle because that's Ben's blind side. And we saw Dan Moore, who mostly played, I guess, whatever, okay for a rookie making his debut. He gave up a sack. And you can't be risking that. Uh, without getting into a whole big analysis on the kind of day that Ben Roethlisberger had, he certainly played well enough that you want him to stay your starting quarterback, all right? And for him to do that, he's got to stay vertical. The way Chooks was getting cleaned up on the right side is something no sane coach would allow to have happen on the other side. So you've got two more weeks here to figure this out. My belief, to go to the root of your question here, is that the Steelers will sign a tackle this week. My further belief is that the reason they didn't do it in week one, this is more of a technical thing, is if you sign that player in week one, you're required to have that player have his salary guaranteed for the entire season, which of course affects your cap. But as you're pointing out, they have cap space. They do. They have room. And after 
watching this game, which the Steelers did extremely well to win. I'm not taking any credit away from them, and I'm not, not assigning any sort of, you know, luck or whatever to what happened. But it's really, really good for them that they were able to pull this off with that caliber of offensive line play. They got through it. Now they need to address it. I appreciate the question, Lori. I appreciate everybody listening to Daily Shot of Steelers. Let's do this again tomorrow. Mm-hmm.